I call it advocacy. <laughs> we were advocating people's human rights at the time. But the Candid Community Podcast would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways in the area now known as Marybeck. We pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Peoples communities who significantly contribute to the life of the area. It has always, and will always be, Aboriginal land. This episode of the Candid Community Podcast contains sensitive language that may cause distress. Please take care of yourself. Listener discretion is advised. In today's episode, we have the pleasure of speaking with local Aboriginal leader, Gary Wirukamalu Murray. Thank you for joining us today on the Candid Community Podcast. Thank you. Would you like to start by telling us a bit about your traditional name? Yeah, my traditional name was given to me by my father when I grew up a bit, and um, probably about 1980s, I think I got the name. So it's Wirka Malu, and Wirka Malu is spelled W-Y-R-K-E-R. Wirka is the messenger. Malu is the name of the river, and that's spelled M-I-L-L-O. So it's Wirka Malu, the messenger from the Murray River. Um, in the old days... The message would be a whistling spear, that is a Wiramanda. Wiramanda is a whistling spear. And if you heard that sound, whistling spear, that was the last thing you heard before the spear hit your head. So my father was named Wiramanda Stuart Murray. Because he was like that, right? symbolically speaking. So those terms are really interesting and they connect us to our country. Wurikamalu is a Wamba Wamba First Nation language word. And, uh, and I used to sign my emails off as Wurikamalu, Gary Murray. Um, the Murray part come from Scottishmen. And I understand your family were the first well known Aboriginal family to settle in Glenroy in the 1950s. Can you tell us more about your connection to Glenroy and the surrounding suburbs? Yeah. When we moved here, we were the only family. Um, there was no other Aboriginal families around here, and it was vast tracts of paddocks with um, prickles and lush grass and all that sort of stuff. And um, originally, we our ancestors come from the mountains, uh, due to rail country in the Alps. We come from the Order Order on the Murray River and Barap and Wamba and Jajawarung on the Loddon and also... We're a guy group on the Wimmer River, as well as that, we were Radri, Central New South Wales. So we're multi clan through my Aboriginal mother, Nora Nichols, was her maiden name, and my father's John Stewart Murray from Lake Boga. Mum was from Cumbergunja, she was born there. And in the old days, when I was born in 1951, so I've got about 71 years up my sleeve, but I was born at Barrow Runnell, and mum had to conceive me on the veranda of the old Barrow Arnold Hospital. That's what they'd done with um, Aboriginal women back then, them days. Um, they weren't allowed to birth in the hospitals. They had to go outside on the veranda. And I was born on a veranda at Barrow Arnold. And we lived on the island, which was a island surrounded by Devil's Creek and the Murrumbidgee. So every now and then it would flood. A bit, bit like what it is, probably worse than what it is today. We got flooded out, so mum had to row a boat with a couple of kids in it. At that point she had four kids, so she had two in a fruit uh, box and had to row three miles into town, Barrow Arnold, through um, snake-infested water and spiders and red gum and snakes and all that sort of stuff. And Dad had the other rowboat, rowboat and he um, rowed that one into town about three miles. So that was it for my mother because um, she'd witnessed... 52 degree heat where the sparrows were just dropping out of the sky dead she witnessed red bellied black snakes and um, spiders and we sort of started up living in a tent uh, mum and dad and the three kids and we lived on this island so it was snake infested and all that sort of stuff and I, I never got bitten by a snake when I was a toddler and I used to go around looking for them looking under the bushes and all that eh? and my uncle Bevan Nichols he used to flog me and he reckon I had a real hard head because I kept on doing it. So once we got flooded out, 
we moved to Camp Pell. Camp Pell was an Army, American Army military base at Royal Park. And we lived there for about six months while they transitioned us into housing commission houses out here, Glenroy. So we were there for about six months, and um, that was an interesting experience. I still remember parts of it. There was other Aboriginal families like the Lovetts there. Um, and the Thomases, I think, were there. But we ended up moving to Glenroy about 1955, 56, I reckon it would have been. Um, I was looking at my primary school photos with my siblings and... Um, one of the photos got my older sister die. as a class photo, 1959. So we must have been here about 57, 58, because she went to Glenroy North and then she went to Glenroy Primary. Um, so we moved to Glenroy out there and it was just paddocks. Paddocks, right through to Campbellford, just paddocks, open grasslands. And um, it was um, interesting growing up in Glenroy and um, I was only there about six months and I was playing out in the backyard and a brown snake bit me on the arm. Got me right there. So I had to come to the city to get bitten by a Wurundjeri snake. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I ended up, the old man carried me down to the Glenroy Medical Centre in uh, Pasco Vale Road. And I went through the treatment and I came, went back to the neighbourhood and everyone greeted me. And I, I remember I got Tarax lemonade and an icy pole as a reward for surviving that snake bite. But I felt really sorry for the snake because my mother, I've never seen her, got angry, but she got angry. And we said this old um, kettle, and she boiled it up, boiling point, and she carried it out to where the snake went down the hole and poured the boiling water down there. I reckon that snake got cooked. <laughs> <laughs> that's my story, that's my snake story. Um, but growing up, we obviously went to this school. We were actually sitting in the building when I was in uh, grade six and grade five next door. And all the earlier classes, like you know, from bubs to um, grade one, two, three, four, there's a long line of classrooms going that way. And um, we went to all of them. I, I, I attended school late here, so I was in... They wouldn't put me in bubs because I was too big. And then they put me in grade one and I was too smart. They put me in grade two halfway through that first year. So I ended up in grade two and then got promoted into grade three. So I had a pretty rapid sort of process in that sense. Um, and my siblings were here too. So I've got, um, I had three sisters and uh, four brothers. So there was one of us in every class. So if you mess with us, you had to fight a lot, <laughs> including the girls, <laughs> who were worse than the boys. So um, it was an interesting period of time in my life at Glenroy Primary. We were poor as uh, mice. And um, you know, I can remember we'd come to school, eight of us, and um, we'd have to, my brother would have to get on his bike and ride home three miles. We lived in Heather Court next to the old high school, Glenroy High School. And he'd come back with a, a Wheaties packet full of, full of uh, pancakes. And we had pancakes every day. Every day we had pancakes. I hate, I hate pancakes. <laughs> the kids love them today. They go to Macca's and they order pancakes, but I just look at them real hard. But in the end we got smart about it and we used to sit under the willow tree and all the white kids would come up to some... They were real curious about pancakes. So we figured, we'll trade. <laughs> so we traded for a half sandwich, half an apple, whatever was there. And um, that's how we survived. My brother had a paper round and he was out early in the morning, about three o'clock, in order to get, supplement the income. And I actually worked in Tom, the fish and chip shop man's shop in which he prayed here, actually from grade two, grade three onwards. Now, who would send their kid to work at that age? It was my choice. But I used to go there every day after school for three hours and um, I'd empty a 200-pound potato sack full of potatoes into a six tins. And then Tom would then chip them. That was my job, put the potatoes in those tins. 
and it was you know, pretty boring, but it was okay because we ended up getting you know, three shillings out of it and a feed of fish and potato cakes. And that would supplement the diet. That went on right through primary school. And, and um, one of the things I suppose that we learnt was don't cop anything from anybody because Dad was pretty strong at it. And we had a lot of racism, of course. Um, we were the only Aboriginal family in Glenroy. And, um, you know, we get the usual abos and bongs and whether we're on the sporting field or walking down the street, we cop that all the time. So we obviously got taught to fight. I call it advocacy. <laughs> we were advocating people's human rights at the time, but there was a lot of, um, you know, talking pretty hard to people to try and educate them about racism from the day we were here. And... Um, it was always on the footy field. We, we played football, good footballers and cricketers and basketballers and all that, so we got right into sports stuff. And that was our best tool to educate people because we were good at it and we wanted to be, you know, be able to beat people in sport and that. So right through primary school, we played footy and cricket and we won awards for it. Um, not just me, but my brother and sister did too. We were all good at it and we could all fight. So that sort of protected us from the real bad stuff. The fact that we had a group of us and um, we had a strong father and a strong mother who didn't drink, didn't smoke, and they brought us up proper. As you mentioned, you attended the former Glenroy Primary School, which we are recording in what used to be the original Grade 6 classroom today, in the Heritage Wing at the Glenroy Community Hub. If you could talk to your younger self, what would you say? When I was playing cricket out in the Oval there, and school bought the beautiful new cricket bats and you could hit a ball for miles right so I was playing out there and I was batting and good old Mr Cherry was teaching the girls how to play softball in the corner over there and I whacked this ball so hard and I hit him right on the cheek sort of stunned him didn't knock him out or nothing but it definitely would have hurt him (laughs) so I regret that I would tell my younger self not to hit the ball as hard when it's other groups around the oval. It's not fair. <laughs> and poor Mr. Cherry, I'd, I'd, I'd be probably gone now, but he was a good fella and um, he took it in, in, in good good faith and we were okay with it. But I suppose in life, um, you know, you go through stages. Primary school's one of those stages. Um, high school was another one. And then obviously growing up and getting married and having kids and all that. So, it's all got to be what I call proper. You've got to have that moral code and, you know, do the right thing by everybody, including your neighbours and, you know, your parents and everything else. And, you know, don't do drugs. You know, don't eat alcohol too bad. <laughs> Just control it. Um, so I think it's about discipline. You've got to have discipline and you've got to be able to firmly make decisions about how you implement that decision on anything discipline and decision making and I think if I could talk to my younger self now I would definitely say two things you should have played for North Melbourne and won for won the Brownlow medal in a grand final in 1984 that's when they won their first one I went down to North the year before but I was going to my nation I was married so I, I couldn't do the six days a week they were trying so I was disappointed in that and I regret that um, I should have played for them. Um, and the second thing, I, I suppose, would be um, I should have finished my law degree. Um, I've got 22 subjects out of 24 from Melbourne Uni. I still do a lot of the stuff I got taught. And, um, uni taught me a lot of things. It taught me about discipline and writing and researching and, and advocating um, people's rights. And what would you say your school experience was like? Well, I, I look back on it now and I think it was probably... They were great times. Um, I met a lot of great people and, um, you know, for, for example, at Glenmore High School, we had regular reunions and it was really good to catch up with people. And um, um, one of my mates was um, Mario Bison. He went on to be an accountant and he owned Metricon Home Group. So that guy was a multi-millionaire. He, he passed away last year. Um, that was sad, but, you know, it just shows you that Guy's worth two hundred million dollars, but he wasn't happy, and um, he committed suicide. So um, that was really bad because he grew up with us in primary school. He went to Glenroy West Primary School, and but he went to Glenroy High with me, and he was one that really stands out in my mind. There was a lot of other people too. Um, 
John O'Connor was a good mate in football and cricket and he played for Carlton. Um, he died of cancer at the age of many 30s, I think. Um, he's another good mate. So you get the good and the bad and the sad and the happy through life and you get that in primary school and secondary school and university and all that and university is another part and another part of the life but different to high school and different to primary but all good. I, I, I don't regret nothing, even the bad stuff. <laughs> Did you always have a thirst for learning? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, if we could get our hands on a book when we were in primary school, I'd take it home and I'd read it. And I'd read all night, you know, whether it was fiction or... Mainly they were fiction books and stuff like that, but anything we get our hands on, we'd read it. And, you know, we were pretty poor. Um, we didn't have a TV till he was 59, I think, 1959. Black and white TV. It all changes over time. It gets more modern, but, you know, you respect poverty and you always carry it with you. So I don't want for I don't want to be a millionaire or nothing like that. I don't want to own a big flash house. Why? Well, you know, you can't take it with you, as my old man used to say. You can't take it with you. So what's the point? Um, you leave it to your kids and all that, I suppose, but they've also got to get out and make their way too. What was it like growing up as a young Aboriginal man in so-called Australia? Well, we, we, we went through the 60s, so we were all mods. So we dressed like the Rolling Stones. <laughs> we were Rolling Stones. We weren't Elvis Presley. We were Rolling Stones uh, and Beatles. Beatles were good. Um, so we, we grew up in that. And um, you know, there were Sharpies and mods and rockers and widgies and all that sort of stuff. And they were good times because, you know, we were teenagers growing up and we'd go to dances and KB Town Hall as well as um, Port Manor's Town Hall. Um, and um, a lot of people had a lot of respect for us because of our sporting stuff as well as our fighting ability and all that. We had a gang. <laughs> and we didn't bind the blue every now and then on the streets um, in order to advocate our human rights. <laughs> so... It was all good, and um, growing up, you, know, you, you copped the bad with the good. Um, I remember we um, assaulted a, a 12 gentlemen on a bus coming out of the Cobig Town Hall. We got on a bus to go home to Glenroy, and um, um, we got into a blue in, in Bell Street, just back from Sydney Road. There four of us versus 12 of them, and we were getting a bit of a hiding, but... Um, I took off, my brother stayed and his mate stayed and um, cops got him and gave him a bit of a beating up the alley. But um, I took off, I was pretty fit, so I started running home from Glenroy, from Bell Street. So I get to Derby Street and I start hitchhiking, big mistake. Car picks me up, little Morris Miner, green one, and I jump in and it's the same guys we just beat up. <laughs> that was ironical. And... Um, so I couldn't get out of the car because they locked it somehow. I, I couldn't get out of it. And they had these bits of iron and stuff. And um, um, they took me back to the police station, the police station, the old one here. Yeah. And I um, and, uh, got charged. I was too honest. I told them what happened. I called us abos. Um, so bunch up. Um, nobody got killed. <laughs> Except they got a hiding, right? And um, so I go to court and... For the first time, you know, we haven't got an Aboriginal legal service at that point. That was 1970. And I go to the magistrate in Coburg there, and I've got a lawyer. I've got my father there and my grandfather there. And I thought, and I'm doing my trick. And I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking, I've got everything going for me here, except for the fact I'm black. <laughs> and sure enough, got locked up. So I did, um, I think it was a month in Pentridge, and that was a lesson. Pentridge, wow. Was that under maximum security at the time? That was in um, J Division, which is sort of like young fellas. And I was about 18. But um, there was other Aboriginal prisoners in there that I eventually met. Um, but she was a tough old jail and um, they put us in remand with the officers, COVID, that's on that side. And it was pretty rough in there. They'd take your boots, take your runners give you a belt and all that, but ironically, I don't know whether you remember TV ringside, it was a boxing thing, and there was a guy named Ted Bonner on there, and when they got me in the pantry, they cut your hair, and I looked like him, 
and I could fight too, so it wasn't bad. So this guy tried to take my runners, <laughs> so he got biffed, and that was it. They left me alone. Well, lucky, but um, it was pretty serious stuff, and ended up in the veggie patch on the Murray Roadside picking tomatoes. And um, I remember it was summer, it was, it was sort of March, it was pretty hot. But I met the Lovitz and Sonny Booth, my ventral coach at Detroit Stars. I met him in there and all that, and he was a, he was a gangster. <laughs> but the interesting thing was when we got out, we had to line up in front of that big clock, and there was about 10 of us getting released. And I made, I made a couple of dollars in the tomato patch, they pay you. And that was enough to get a cab back then. So I'm all lined up, and we had to watch the clock tick down. So it's on the 10 minute line. We've got 10 minutes to stand there in the heat. The guys just drop it to their paint, painting in the heat. <laughs> and then they let us go, open up the big gate, let us out. We just done that. Long ones down the Sydney Road, grabbed the nearest cab, went home. And um, when I got home, I did my usual thing. I opened up the mailbox to um, get the mail for mum. And it was a Friday afternoon. And, um, there's a letter from the school saying that if it is true that uh, your son has uh, been incarcerated in Coburg Penitentiary, then consider him expelled. So I got expelled. From Glenroy High School? From Glenroy High, yeah. So um, because I just got out and I was so stressed, I went out with mates and all that sort of stuff and we went on a rampage for about two days. But the second night, I was in Coburg at some party and um, um, all my brothers and that left and I was there on my own. All of a sudden, I felt all this hostility around me. I think, oh, time to take off. So off I go, start running. I'm getting milk bottles thrown at me and I'm falling down, <laughs> dodging them like this on the, on the bitumen on the road. I was scarred up there, elbows, knees. And I made it back to the bungalow in Glenroy where we, all the boys slept in the bungalow at the backyard. I was that sore and sorry for myself and it was only the second day I'd been out and then the door crashes open in the morning I'm sick as a dog. The old man says, right, are you ready to go back to school, son? Yes. That was the answer. So he took the school to court and hit the, hit the newspapers about how we're discriminated against and because there was other guys that did the same thing different times. But I was singled out by that. Uh, principal, Mr. Pincher, and you know, he might have had the interest of the school and hand, I don't know, but ended up getting, um, the decision was reversed, so I went back to school. And what were your thoughts on the newly arrived migrants that settled in the area around the 1950s and 60s? Oh, we're the gang, United Nations gang at high school. We're Italians, Maltese, uh, Greeks, us, um, Russians, <laughs> we had everybody in the gang and you couldn't touch none of them. Right, you could not pick on none of our gang. That's the way it was, you know. Everybody looked after each other, and um, this community has always been multicultural. Uh, it's, not, it's not a recent thing. The dynamics might have changed a little bit, but geez, Glenwood High School was so multicultural. It was a joke. Um, uh, we were the only Aboriginal people there, of course, but um, they had every nation there, and we all got along pretty good. And it was mainly sport that did that, I think, and um, you know. We made friends. A lot of them guys are still around. It run into every now and then. We see them on Facebook. This is the end of part one of Yarning with Gary Wirikamalu Murray. Check out part two for the full interview. If any of the topics in today's episode has caused distress, please reach out to the number of support networks listed in each of our episode descriptions. Take care, and until next time, keep it candid. <laughs>